Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And now we'll continue where we left off yesterday in the book, The Global Vatican, by former ambassador to the, to, to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. And uh, it's an inside look at the Catholic Church, world politics, and the extraordinary relationship between the United States and the Holy See. We're currently reading in part two of chapter two, which is entitled The Last Pope. And it's a very, very interesting chapter. And we'll back up now for continuity purposes uh, to the beginning of part two. It says, the not so secret secret of the church's survival comes down to two great traditions that have sustained it through history. These can be broadly characterized as theology and diplomacy. Okay? Theology and diplomacy. By, by the way, somebody remind me, if I'm not mistaken, I see nothing in the Bible about it being, about diplomacy being the role of the body of Christ. But diplomacy is a role a major role, a sustaining role in the Roman Catholic Church, the antithesis of the body of Christ. It says, although diplomacy is the focus of this book, theology and fundamental teachings of the church cannot be ignored. Catholic theology, now that's dis distinguished from biblical theology, after all, theology, the very definition of theology is the study of God. Okay, and where would you go to learn about God? Well, you'd go to the book he wrote, wouldn't you? The Bible. And if you went anywhere else, you would likely be misled, wouldn't you? Well, that's what the Roman Catholic Church is all about. That's what Catholic theology is all about. It's the study of God. But they define God a little differently than you and I do. They define God as being represented represented by the papacy okay so the god of roman catholic theology is the papacy and you'll understand that the knowledge of that god is embodied in the roman catholic church and it is contrary to the bible Catholic theology, as understood in general terms, encompasses the church's capacity to define and refine its message through the ages, achieving balance. Yeah, don't you just love that word? Achieving balance between constancy and renewal. Starting with the first great ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325, the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, sought to express a clear and unified creed. However, Catholicism was never simple. Any religion founded on the belief that a man born of God also is God, listen carefully, any religion founded on the belief that a man born of God also is God is profound and invokes serious reflection. And which God do you think they're talking about? It says, in fact, that very issue, whether Jesus was both man and God, was on the agenda at the Council of Nicaea. Strange, they had to convene a council to determine whether or if Jesus was a man and God. Why, why didn't they just consult the scriptures? Anyway, it says, countless councils after Nicaea, from Trent, the Council of Trent, which ran from 1545 to 1563, to Vatican Council II, which ran from 1962 to 1965, were devoted to defining exactly what Roman Catholicism is and is not. She's still trying to define herself. <laughs> While many people dislike certain aspects in the doctrinal rulings of the Catholic Church, no one can deny that over time, 
the church has done a remarkable job of preserving the integrity of its message. No mention of the Bible here. It's done a remarkable job of preserving the integrity of its message, its core values, its immutable beliefs, while adapting, albeit gradually, to progress and change. In some respects, the Catholic Church can be compared to the ship of Theseus. What happens to the identity of an old ship, this ancient paradox poses, when the parts of it that have rotted or worn out are replaced? The ship inevitably changes as its parts change. What becomes of the ship if over time nearly all the original material is replaced? Is it still the same ship? In the case of the Catholic Church, the answer is a resounding affirmative, says the author. Though the church has been renewed countless times, has evolved and adjusted through the course of history, it is unmistakably the same ship that set sail from the Holy Land 2,000 years ago. Uh, The Bible's more specific than that. It's uh, unmistakably the same ship that set sail from Babylon more than 2,000 years ago. In his first Christmas address to the Roman Curia, Pope Benedict XVI, the successor of St. Peter, whose very person represents the continuity of the Holy See, described the church as, quote, a subject which increases in time and develops yet always remaining the same, the one subject of the journeying people of God, the journeying people of God, unquote. (laughs) Cardinal James Harvey, the first American ever to serve as the prefect of the papal household, told me that despite all the years and evolutions of the church in the world, quote, the basic principles stay the same, unquote. Yes, it began, and it is still today, 2,000 years later, the Church of Antichrist. I will just add. He continues, he says, Holy Seed diplomacy is a means of applying those basic principles to real-life problems in the world of nations, states, and communities. See, it's, it's universal. Nations, states, and communities. That's where you live, right? Holy See diplomacy is a means of applying those basic, that is, Roman Catholic principles to real-life problems in the world, most problems fomented by the Jesuits. Remember the Hegelian dialectic, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or uh, problem, reaction, solution. They caused the problem. They manage the reaction of the people and then propose a solution. Again, he says, Holy Seed diplomacy is a means of applying those basic principles to real-life problems in the world of nations, states, and communities. You see how this could evolve into a global government from Rome through the federal government, through your state government, through your county government, and through your local municipality. He's plainly telling you how tightly woven the spider's web is and the reach of the papacy right down to your very neighborhood. He says, through the exercise of its diplomacy, The Holy See seeks to advance freedom, safeguard human dignity, and protect the human condition in a variety of contexts. I suppose the global pedophile priest pandemic is just one example how the Roman Catholic Church seeks to advance freedom, safeguard human dignity, and protect the human condition. In the words of Cardinal John Louis Turan, one of the Vatican's most respected and distinguished diplomats, quote, 
The Holy See, which enjoys international juridical status, that is, international judging status. It's the judge of the whole world. Remember, Roman Catholic canon law says the Pope is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. Okay? We recently heard from the world court they can't decide whether or not they even have jurisdiction over the papacy in all the litigation being, uh, you know, all the litigation coming upon the, 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 the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. They don't have jurisdiction. Okay, Roman Catholic canon law. The Pope is judge of every man and no man may judge him. So it's an international juridical institution. The Holy See, this is a quote, the Holy See, which enjoys international juridical status, is presented as a sovereign and independent moral authority. There's no man may judge him, see? Preserved as, or rather presented as a sovereign and independent moral authority, I would say immoral authority, antichrist authority, and as such, takes part in international relations. Does the head of your church take play, uh, 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 function in international relations? See the difference between the Church of Antichrist and the body of Christ? He says, within nations, its actions as a moral authority aims at furthering an ethic of relations between the different protagonists of the international community, unquote. The Holy See expresses and elaborates upon its principles and values in a most secular context, the affairs of states. Okay. The Holy See expresses and elaborates upon its principles and values in a most secular context, the affairs of states. It's not just a church. It's a government. And it's not of, by, and for the people. And Christ is not the head of it. The Pope is. And he reaches into the affairs of states. And we're going to see as we continue reading in this chapter how what, what set this precedent what set this precedent that gives the papacy the moral authority to interject itself into the affairs of states? It's all going to make sense to you as we continue. He says, as such, the Holy See brings a unique perspective to international relations. Here is Father Robert Graham again, quoting a definition of ecclesiastical diplomacy from an Italian guide to diplomacy. He says, quote, the science and art which is directed toward ordering the reciprocal rights and duties resulting from the coexistence of the church with the various states in which, while tending constantly to the advancement and uh, adv advancement the interests of the Holy See, at the same time promotes and preserves peaceful relations between the two powers. Unquote. The peaceful relations between two powers. But the Bible, which is ignored by the papacy, uh, obviously, the Bible speaks of wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we find in careful examinations of the wars of the world, it's the papacy that oversees and promotes and preserves its relationships its dominance over the nations by threat of war. Okay. Church officials, says the author, have always known how important diplomacy is to them. This is why they have, they have been studying and teaching it for hundreds of years in the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy, the world's first professional school for diplomats, founded by the Vatican, in 1701. Archbishop Pietro Sambi, Apostolic Nuncio to the United States from 2005 until his death in 2011, 
once explained the three key principles of the Holy Seed diplomacy as follows. The first is truth, because, quote, if you don't know the truth, you can't build peace, unquote. There's the basis for the global intelligence apparatus of the Roman Catholic Church, which goes all the way down to street level in the very confessional boxes in which Roman Catholics confess their sins into the ear of their priests. A global, international web of espionage and intelligence gathering. That's how they come to the truth, as they see it, obviously. Now, the second is justice, the concept of which, quote, in the modern times is a little bit lost, unquote. I wouldn't argue with him there. And he says the concept in which, in, uh, says, and the third is freedom, quote, something at the time was a surprise in the, ch something that at the time was a surprise in the church itself, unquote. <laughs> Of all freedoms, says Archbishop Samby, quote, first is religious freedom and freedom of conscience, unquote. Let me tell you something. In the New World Order, there will be freedom of religion and freedom of conscience so long as it is not biblically based. At that point, Bible-based Christians are going to be labeled as enemies of the state, hate mongers, and religious fanatics, and in direct conflict with all the various religions of the world who will have already accepted the papacy's authority. We're the last holdouts for the truth. And we're going to be seen as rebels, we're going to be seen as protesters, nonconformists. We're going to be called anarchists. We're going to be called those who put the, the real, the most real threat to this new global government and global religion and global economic system. Those who hold out for the truth with the Bible in their hand and the word of God on their lips. You see, Satan who is the head of the Roman Catholic Church, he really doesn't care which religion you practice as long as you are ultimately responsible to his vicar. The only thing Satan cares about is that you don't name Jesus as your sole authority in faith and morals. A heavenly Jesus one that is coming to destroy this earthly counterfeit called Christianity based in Roman Catholicism. You know, we're all familiar with the, the term radical fundamentalists. We're all concerned about this so-called threat that the Muslims will overtake the Western world and will all be under Sharia law, and that there is a segment of the Islamic religion that are fanatics and think that it's, well, a righteous thing to kill a non-Muslim. <clears throat> you realize that is the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the bloody history? You, we never hear of that anymore. That's considered politically incorrect speech to regurgitate the history of the Roman Catholic Church and her abuses against God's people. You can talk about the Muslims all you want. You can call them radical extremists. But once they've got the world conditioned, that's the word, conditioned to have zero tolerance for radical fundamentalists, then all they have to do is apply that term to true Bible-believing Christians. And then we'll have, as we have always had, quote-unquote Christians killing Christians. We're being set up. 
we're being conditioned to follow the dictates of the global dictator. And that is at the, at the expense of the true body of Christ. Now he says, the church's status as a diplomatic entity was questioned throughout history. Some of the church's own bishops dismissed it as a distraction from the Holy See's pastoral mission. You see, some of those wise bishops thought that if the Pope had any authority at all, it ought to be limited to, well, spiritual things and not carnal. I agree. But then he fails in the first mission as well. He says the last major internal challenge to papal diplomacy came during Vatican Council II. Pope Paul VI answered it eloquently and effectively. In fact, he had already mounted a defense of diplomacy years before he became Pope. In a 1951 speech made on the 250th birthday of the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy. Holy See diplomacy, he declared then, is, quote, the art of creating and maintaining the international order, which is the art of establishing human relationships, reasonable law between nations, and not through force or inexorable contrast and balance of interests, unquote. Let's dissect this, shall we? Holy See diplomacy, according to Vatican Council II Pope John, or Pope Paul VI, Holy See diplomacy, he declared, is, quote, the art of creating and maintaining the international order. Let me read it correctly. The art of creating and maintaining the Pope's new world order, which is, the art of establishing human relationships, that's civil law, the art of establishing human relationships, that's control of the government, reasonable law between nations, that's international government, and not through force or inexorable contrast in the balance of interest. Listen, you know what this this we're not gonna we're not gonna wage war anymore like we used to. We're not going to burn people at the stake. We're not gonna stretch people on the rack. We're just gonna make a cashless society where you have no cash in your pocket. It's all on a computer screen someplace, it's all digits in a vast memory bank and if you don't cooperate we're not going to kill you we're just going to turn the switch and shut off your account and then you're going to reach in your pockets and say well I don't need bit currency I'll just take my dollar bill well they're worthless see it's a cashless society they can shut off your ability to buy and sell. Just shut it off. When you walk into the store and you go fill your cart with the necessities of life, bread, milk, and eggs, meat, and you go to the counter and they check it all out and they go to your digital account and it's not there. And the clerk says, I'm sorry. But uh, economic sanctions have evidently been placed against you for whatever reason. You must be a Bible thumper. You must be a radical religious extremist. You're not going along with the New World Order, so they've imposed economic sanctions. They've just shut you off, and you have nothing with which to pay for the food that you must now return to the shelves. See how it works? you see how the new world order is going to work? They don't have to wage war anymore. We'll be back right after this.
You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it It has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to contact me, please do so at tom at seawaves.us. Tom at seawaves, like the waves of the sea, dot U-S. And if you'd like to see Inquisition Update continue on First Amendment Radio, please, please make a contribution to First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. Now, continuing where we left off, what is this uh, diplomacy that is so valuable, so much a part of the so-called Holy See? Holy See diplomacy, he declared, is, quote, the art of creating and maintaining the international order, which is the art, that is, the international order, is the art of establishing human relationships. And how do you do that? Through the civil law, total control of the civil government, reasonable law between nations, that's international law, and not through force or inexorable contrast and balance of interests, unquote. Diplomatic engagement, quote, is not exclusive to defend the interests of a nation, but instead is of mutual benefit, common interest, and universal value. And what do we know about the word universal? It means Catholic. They're interchangeable words. You see how open they are with their agenda? 
but it's spoken in terms that most people can't understand. To you, it sounds like gobbledygook until you know what the intent and purpose is behind their words. On June 24, 1969, Paul VI further established the basis for the Holy See's diplomatic engagement with the world in his landmark apostolic letter entitled Solicitudo Omnium Ecclesium. Here's what he said. It is true that the aims of church and state are of a different order, and both are perfect societies, equipped with their own means and independent in their respective spheres of action. But it is also true that the one and the other act for the benefit of a common subject, man called by God to eternal salvation and offered a place on earth to enable him, with the help of grace, to pursue a life of work, leading him to be in peaceful coexistence with others. Do you, does anybody but me hear the word slavery involved in this? He said, it is true that the aim of church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, and the state, that is, every government on the planet, are of a different order, and both are perfect society. Listen, the Roman Catholic Church is made up of men. So are the states, the governments of every state. All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no earthly church, especially not the Roman Catholic Church, and there is no earthly state headed up by sinful, fallen, wicked men, and all dominated by the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist that will ever bring in Christ's righteousness. And that's why Daniel prophesied in his metal man image that every human government in the history of the world is an abject failure and will be destroyed when Christ returns. And then that stone, which was cut out of the mountain without hands, after it has destroyed all human efforts to govern itself, will become a great mountain and will fill the whole earth. Finally, Christ's righteousness will arrive. True justice, the real Christ, not the Antichrist. What, how, how much faith should you have in the American government, you patriots out there? When Daniel prophesied their ultimate destruction by Christ himself, how much faith should you place in the American government? How much faith should you place in the, well, the, uh, the UN, the United Nations? How much faith should you place in the priests of the Roman Catholic Church? How much faith should you place in a pope who is so wicked and sinful as to call himself the replacement of Jesus on the earth? Well, Tom, you're tearing my whole foundation. That's right. You have to have Christ as your foundation. We have to start realizing something. This whole earth is going to be destroyed, renovated by fire. And then a new heaven and a new earth God will create. Where should our loyalties and our patriotism be awarded? In the earth or in the heavenlies? We have in store for us a real king, a benevolent king, one who died for us. We have a real kingdom in which rules righteousness. And we have a guarantee of peace and plenty. Absent the torments of Satan and the deceptions of the false prophet and the Antichrist, that's where my loyalties lie. 
I may call myself an American in casual conversation, but I'm no American. I don't belong to any place but there, the holy kingdom of Christ. I have a king, I have a kingdom, and I have a constitution. It's called the Bible. It's the law of God. And God hasn't changed one jot or tittle of it. And he expects obedience from his subjects. And we ought to be willing to give it. And the first thing is to renounce this phony counterfeit, this phony earthly counterfeit. We're not to be a part of this world. He says the true aims of the church and the state are of different order and both are perfect societies. Wrong. They are incurably fallible. Equipped with their own means and we've covered for nearly a decade on the Inquisition update the means of both this church and the states over which they rule, and independent in their respective spheres of action. That's right, the Pope dictates, the civil government implements. Together, they form the beast. The woman rides the beast. It says, but it is also true that the one and the other act for the benefit of a common subject. Benefit? Then why is God going to destroy it? They both act, one and the other, for the benefit of a common subject, man, called by God to eternal salvation and offered a place on earth to enable him with the help of grace, and you know in Roman Catholicism there is no grace outside the Roman Catholic Church, to pursue a life of work. So that's your destiny here on this earth, is to work. And then you'll be led to be in peaceful coexistence with others. Okay? Now I have nothing against work. But I have a lot against working day in, day out, just to pay my taxes, to support this Pope's New World Order. You know, the power to tax is the power to rob, steal, and kill. Rome made taxation, well, absolutely necessary. Rome made taxation cool. And every nation in the world follows her lead. When you pay your taxes, do you ever question where your tax money goes? What does it go? Where does it go? What does it support? Wars. Killing. Global inquisitions and global crusades. And what is the, the end game? of all these wars to create a global government over which the Pope will rule. You see, when you pay your taxes, you're paying to support and to build this new world order. Is that Christ's righteousness? Is our government taxing us for godly purposes or antichrist purposes? The answer seems clear to me. Paul the Sixth continued, he said, quote, It follows that certain activities of church and state are, in a sense, complementary, and that the good of the individual and the community of nations requires an open dialogue and a genuine understanding between the church, on the one hand, and the states on the other, and the states on the other hand. 
in order to establish, foster, and strengthen relationships of mutual understanding, mutual coordination and cooperation, and to prevent or remedy any disagreements. We're going to tolerate any disagreements. Not going to tolerate any disagreements. In order to achieve the implementation of great human hopes, peace between nations, and domestic tranquility and progress of each country. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible he, the, he's, he says the result of this will be great human hopes, peace between nations, domestic tranquility. It's just going to be like the new heaven and the new earth, isn't it? Then why is Jesus coming to destroy it if this is true? This man is an abject liar. He knows what this is all about. This is about enslaving the whole world for the benefit of the Pope. That's what this is all about. And they call it great human hope. Great human hope. You know, Satan once said he said he would be like the Most High, didn't he? Well, he is. In the Antichrist world, he is. And we're all made subjects without our knowledge, without our approval. Yes, we may profess Jesus. We may love him with all of our heart, but we're forced to serve this Antichrist in Rome. We are no less enslaved than were the Israelites under Pharaoh. Absolutely no less enslaved than were the Israelites under Pharaoh in Egypt. God delivered them once. May he deliver them once again. He says, well before the 18th century, the Roman Catholic Church proved capable of organizing its foreign relations and negotiating its way through the intrigues and rivalries of Europe's dynasties. Having no standing military to project or protect its interests, the church drew its strength from religious faith and moral suasion, both intangible but real. It relied on the premises noted earlier, which were taught in the academy and practiced by papal nuncios positioned around the civilized world. That's right, papal nuncios positioned by the Pope all around the civilized world. Napoleon Bonaparte would call these assets the Pope's, quote, lever of opinion, unquote, a tool that could also be used, if needed, as a blunt instrument. So much for peaceful coexistence, right? Quote, deal with the Pope as if he had 200,000 men at his command. Unquote. Napoleon instructed an aide in 1801, converting papal influence into military currency. What was Napoleon saying? He doesn't have a visible standing army. He just looks like a doddering old fool on a marble white stone, on a white, white, great white throne. He may look harmless, but he commands legions. Deal with him accordingly. Not so prescient was Joseph Stalin, who once derisively dismissed the Vatican for its lack of firepower. Quote, how many divisions has the Pope? Unquote. Of course, Stalin's regime is now long gone. So is Napoleon's. And the Catholic Church, it endures. It endures because the only one with the power to destroy it, 
the only one prophesied to destroy it is Christ himself at his return. Oh, and by the way, Joseph Stalin was a Jesuit priest. Communism, like democracy, was the brainchild, of, was, the, was the, the, the brain trust of, well, the cardinals of Rome and the Jesuit priests of Rome. So was fascism. Fascism was just another form of, of government experimented with by the papacy. Remember, he's the king of kings and therefore the establishment of all government, whether it's fascism, communism, or democracy. See why it endures? They've kept all this secret from us. Now, part three of this chapter, is, uh, he, he goes on, the diplomacy that has allowed the church to survive and often thrive is a function by definition of its compatibility with temporal governments, whether monarchies or democracies, whether Catholic or not. A concern in some quarters, as old and enduring as the church itself, is that the Vatican will overreach. <laughs> if you call the New World Order overreaching, it has. He says, during the mid-20th century, when John F. Kennedy explicitly disavowed papal influence during the run for his presidency, many Americans were convinced the church had designs on the United States. Many Americans who read their Bible, particularly Revelation chapter 13, would have known full well that Rome had designs upon the United States. He says, as I write this, I have before me a book published in the United States in 1949 entitled The Vatican in World Politics, in which author Avril Manhattan claims that the church was, quote, feverishly engaged in the race for the ultimate spiritual conquest of the world, a, va a Vatican plot as indisputable and as inextricably a part of contemporary history as the rise of Hitler, the defeat of Japan, and the existence of communism. And I will just simply add, Avril Manhattan failed to include that the Vatican gave rise to all of them. John F. Kennedy, back in the early 60s, when there was just a shred of Protestantism left in this world, merely a shred remember this is during vatican council too when the when the when the protestants are renouncing their protestantism having now been sold the lie the jesuit lie called futurism in a future antichrist that hasn't come yet some protestants feared you remember that greatest of all evils to be feared popery well, John F. Kennedy was a card-carrying Roman Catholic. As a matter of fact, he was a member of the Knights of Columbus. And they had genuine fear, although the, uh, the heritage of Protestantism was escaping them even as they spoke, but they feared that this Roman Catholic president might allow the Pope to control his government. So Kennedy had to go around the country guaranteeing the, Pro the Protestants that no Pope's going to run his White House. Of course... John F. Kennedy realized that uh, the Pope was running the White House before he was ever elected, and he just inherited the Pope's control of the White House when he got there. And I, I believe it led to a, well, a Protestant come to Jesus meeting for John F. Kennedy, and he went to war against the papacy, and that's why they killed him. But Avril Manhattan wrote the book, The Vatican and World Politics. And I believe I even read it here on the Inquisition Update. If I didn't, I'll read it. I've read the book twice in private reading. Avril Manhattan predicted, well, just like it says, that the Roman Catholic Church is feverishly engaged in a race for the ultimate spiritual conquest of the world. A Vatican plot as indisputable and inextricably a part of contemporary history 
as the rise of Hitler, the defeat of Japan, and the existence of communism. It, it, there's no better way, there's no more powerful way to tell you. The Pope's main objective, the very reason for his existence, is to conquer all lands for the Pope. The New World Order, that is the rule of the whole world by the volition of a single man, is the papacy. And don't doubt it. Avro Manhattan was a, an insider. Direct links to the most secret information in the Vatican. And he spilled the beans, just as did uh, Malachi Martin, a Jesuit priest. He said in his book, The Keys of This Blood, that there is a race. Who is going to control this new world order, this global government? Well, it's a race between communism and the Western world, that is the United States and the Western world, or the papacy. And Malachi Martin's assessment was communism and the and the and the West don't don't stand a chance against the Pope. The Pope is going to be just as prophesied, the counterfeit king of kings and lord of lords. And I'll remind you once again, you've seen through diplomacy how the pope controls the governments of the world. This Jesuit pope, Francis I, is planning a visit to the United States, and he's going to speak directly to a joint session of Congress. He's also going to speak at the U.N., and he's going to put the fear of God in all of us. Oh, the world is going to be destroyed through pollution and, and, and economic collapse. And, and well, he, he won't mention a word about priest pedophilia, except to apologize all over and over while it continues. And if we don't, if we don't, well, join this new world order, there's trouble in them, thar hills. That's what's going to be the message. And he's going to come at us with peace in his lips, peace in his eyes, peace and charity. Oh, the charity of the Roman Catholic Church. A truly giving institution. Can't you just see it? Same stuff, different millennia. The Protestant reformers said the gig is up. But there isn't any Protestantism in this country today. Nobody's going to protest. It's a hideous reality. Come, Lord Jesus, that's all i got to say. We better get prayed up, confessed up, make our peace and allegiance with Christ, and denounce this Antichrist while he steals the whole world and all that's in it right out from under us. You think I'm overstating things? History will prove me correct because the Bible's correct, and it predicts it all. That's all we have for today. We'll be back tomorrow on Inquisition Update.